Section 18 of Three Science Fiction Novellas by Lee Brackett Part 6 of Shawnock the Last A hard excitement began to stir in Trevor, too big to be hidden in that secret corner of his mind. He didn't try. He let it loose, and Shawnock murmured, You are pleased. The ship will fly, and you are thinking that when you reach the other valley and are among your own people again, you will find means to destroy me. Perhaps, but we shall see. In the smoky torchlight, looking down from a sagging catwalk above the firing chambers and the rusted sealed-in tubes, Trevor smiled. A lie could be thought of as well as spoken. And Shawnock, in a manner of speaking, was only human. I'll need help. "'All the help there is.' "'You'll have it. "'It'll take time. "'Don't hurry me and don't distract me. "'Remember, I want to get over the mountains as bad as you do.' Shawnock laughed. "'Trevor got more torches and went to work in the generator room. "'He felt that Shawnock had withdrawn from him, "'occupied now with rounding up the Korans and the slaves. "'But he did not relax his caution.' The open areas of his mind were filled with thoughts of vengeance to come when he reached that other valley. Gradually, the exigencies of wrestling with the antiquated and partly ruined machinery drove everything else away. That day passed, and a night, a half another day before all the leads were hooked the way he wanted them, before one creaky generator was operating on one-quarter normal output, and the best of the spare batteries were charging. He emerged from the torch-lit obscurity into the bridge, blinking mole-like in the light, and found Galt sitting there. "'He trusts you,' the coron said, "'but not too far.' Trevor scowled at him. Exhaustion, excitement, and a feeling of fate had combined to put him into an unreal state where his mind operated more or less independently. A hard protective shell had formed around that last little inner fortress so that it was hidden even from himself, and he had come almost to believe that he was going to fly this ship to another valley and battle Shawnock there. So he was not surprised to hear Shawnock say softly in his mind, You might try to go away alone. I wouldn't want that, Trevor. Trevor grunted, I thought you controlled me so well I couldn't spit if you forbade it. I am dealing with much here that I don't comprehend. We were never a mechanical people. Therefore, some of your thoughts, while I read them clearly, have no real meaning for me. I can handle you, Trevor, but I'm taking no chances with the ship. Don't worry, Trevor told him. I can't possibly take the ship up before the hull's repaired. It would fall apart on me. That was true, and he spoke it honestly. Nevertheless, said Shawnock, Galt will be there as my hands and feet, an extra guard over that object which you call a control bank, and which your mind tells me is the key to the ship. You are forbidden to touch it until it's time to go. Trevor heard Shawnock's silent laughter. Treachery is implicit in your mind, Trevor, but I'll have time. Impulses come swiftly and cannot be read beforehand but there is an interval between the impulse and the realization of it. Only a fraction of a second, perhaps, but I'll have time to stop you. Trevor did not argue. He was shaking a little with the effort of not giving up his last pitiful individuality, of fixing his thoughts firmly on the next step toward what Shawnock wanted and looking neither to the right nor to the left of it. He ran a grimy hand over his face shrinking from the touch of the alien disfigurement in his forehead, and said sullenly, The holes have to be cleared. The ship won't lift that weight any more, and we need the metal for repairs. He thought again strongly of weapons. Send the slaves. No, said Shawnock firmly. The Korans will do that. We won't put any potential weapons in the hands of the slaves. Trevor allowed a wave of disappointment to cross his mind, and then he shrugged. All right, but get them at it. He went and stood by the wide ports looking out over the plain toward the city. The slaves were gathered at a safe distance from the ship, waiting like a herd of cattle until they should be needed. 
some mounted corans guarded them while the hawks wheeled overhead coming toward the ship moving with the resentful slowness was a tiny army of corans trevor could sense the group thought quite clearly in all their lives they had never soiled their hands with labor and they were angry that they had now to do the work of slaves digging his nails into his palms trevor went aft to show them what to do he couldn't keep it hidden much longer this thing that he had so painfully concealed under layers of half-truths and deceptions it had to come out soon and shawnock would know in the smoky glare of many torches the corns began to struggle with the rusting masses of machinery in the afterholds send more down here trevor said to shawnock these things are heavy they're all there now except those that guard the slaves they cannot leave all right said trevor make them work he went back up along the canting decks along the tilted passages moving slowly at first then swifter swifter his bare feet scraping on the flakes of rust his face with the third uncanny eye gone white and strangely set his mind was throwing off muddy streams of thought confused and meaningless desperate camouflage to hide until the last second what was underneath trevor that was shadrach alert alarmed it was coming now the purpose out into the light it had to come it could not be hidden any longer it burst up from its secret place one strong red flare against the darkness and shawnock saw it and sent the full cold power of his mind to drown it out trevor came into the bridge room running the first black wave of power hit him crushed him the bridge room lengthened out into some weird dimension of delirium with galt waiting at the far end behind galt the one small little key that needed to be touched just once the towering mind of shawnock beat him back forbidding him to think to move to be but down in that beleaguered part of trevor's mind the walls still held with a bright brand of determination burning in them this was the moment the time to fight and he dug up that armament of fury he had buried there he let it free shouting at the alien force i beat you once i beat you the deck swam under his feet the peeling bulkheads wavered past like veils of mist he didn't know whether he was moving or not but he kept on while the enormous weight bore down on his quivering brain a mountain tilting falling seeking to smother out the fury that was all he had to fight with fury for himself defiled and outraged fury for jen with the red scars on her shoulders fury for hugh lying dead under an obscene killer fury for all the generations of decent people who had lived and died in slavery so that shawnock's time of waiting might be lightened he saw galt's face curiously huge close to his own it was stricken and amazed trevor's bare teeth glistened i beat him once he said to the coron galt's hands were raised there was a knife in his girdle, but he had been bidden not to use it, not to kill. Only Trevor could make the ship fly. Galt reached out and took him, but there was an unsureness in his grip, and his mind was crying out to Shawnock, You could not make him stop. You could not. Trevor, who was partly merged with Shawnock now, heard that cry and laughed. Something in him had burst wide open at Galt's physical touch. He had no control now, no sane thought left, but only a wild, intense desire to do two things, one of which was to destroy this monster that had hold of him. "'Kill him,' said Shannock suddenly. "'He's mad, and no one can control an insane human.' Galt did his best to obey, but Trevor's hands were already around the coron's throat, the fingers seeking deep into the flesh." there was a sharp snapping of bone. He dropped the body. He could see nothing now except one tiny point of light in a reeling darkness. That single point of light had a red key in the center of it. 
Trevor reached out and pushed it down. That was the other thing. For a short second, nothing happened. Trevor sagged down across Galt's body. Shawnock was somewhere else, crying warnings that came too late. Trevor had time to draw one hoarse, triumphant breath and brace himself. The ship leaped under him. There was a dull roar, and then another, as the last fuel bunkers let go. The whole bridge room rolled and came to rest with a jarring shock that split the ports wide open, and the world was full of shriek and crash of metal being torn and twisted and rent apart. Then it quieted. The ground stopped shaking and the deck settled under Trevor. There was silence. Trevor crawled up the new slope of the bridge room floor, to the shattered lock and through it, into the pitiless sunlight. He could see now exactly what he had done. And it was good. It had worked. The last small measure of fuel had been enough. The whole after part of the hulk was gone, and with it gone all but a few of Shawnock's corins, trapped in the lower holds. And then, in pure surprise, Shawnock spoke inside Trevor's mind. I grow old indeed. I misjudged the toughness and the secrecy of a fresh, strong mind. I was too used to my obedient corins. Do you see what's happening to the last of them? Trevor asked savagely. Can you see? The last of the Korans who had been outside with the slaves seemed to have been stunned and bewildered by the collapse of their world. And with the spontaneity of a whirlwind, the slaves had risen against this last remnant of their hated masters. They had waited for a long, long time, and now the Korans and the Hawks were being done to death. Can you see it, Shanok? I can see, Trevor. And they're coming now for you. They were. They were coming, blood mad against all who wore the sunstone, and Jan was in the forefront of them, and Saul, whose hands were red. Trevor knew that he had less than a half a minute to speak for his life. And he was aware that Shanok, still withdrawn, watched now with an edged amusement. Trevor said harshly to Saul and all of them, "'So I give you your freedom, and you want to kill me for it?' Saul snarled, "'You betrayed us in the cave, and now?' "'I betrayed you, but without intent. There was someone stronger than the Korans, and even you didn't know about it. So how should I have known?' Trevor talked fast, then talking for his life, telling them about Shanok and how the Korans themselves were enslaved. A lie, spat Saul. Look for yourselves in the crypts underneath the city, but be careful. He looked at Jan, not at Saul. After a moment, Jan said slowly, Perhaps there is a Shanok. Perhaps that's why we were never allowed in the city, so the Korans could go on pretending that they were gods. It's another of his lies, I tell you. Jan turned to him. Go and look, Saul. We'll watch him. Saul hesitated. Finally, he and a half-dozen others went off toward the city. Trevor sat down on the hot, scorched grass. He was very tired, and he didn't like it all the way the withdrawn shadow of Shanok hoovered just outside his mind. The mountains leaned away from the sun, and the shadows crawled up the lower slopes. Then Saul and the others returned. Trevor looked up at their faces and laughed without mirth. It's true, isn't it? Yes, said Saul, and shivered. Yes. Did he speak to you? He started to, but we ran. And Saul suddenly cried, out of the depths of fear this time and not of hate. We can never kill him. It is his valley. And, oh God, we're trapped in here with him. We can't get out. We can get out said Trevor. End of section 18